Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Legally Live. I'm your host, McKinley Molasa. Today, we are going to go back to the state of Texas versus Caitlin Armstrong case. There are some newish developments in that case. There has been a motion for a new trial filed, and I am going to be going over the motion today. In addition, I saw that several news outlets have put out some of the body cam videos from the case and some of the interrogation videos. I don't think we're going to get to those today, but we will hopefully in the future. So be on the lookout for those. But in the meantime, let's get into this motion. So as you can see, this is actually, a you know, we're a little late on this. This was filed on December 15th, 2023, Caitlin Marie Armstrong in the 403rd District Court of Travis County, Texas. And it says, comes now, Caitlin Marie Armstrong, defendant in the above style, the number of cause, files this motion for new trial pursuant to Texas Rule of Appellate Procedure 21.1A and B and 21.3B and H and 21.9. Texas Code of Criminal Procedure 40.001, the 5th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution and Article 1, Section 19 of the Texas Constitution. Because this motion raises matters outside the trial record, it is properly verified by the attached affidavit and is timely filed and presented. The defendant is entitled to an evidentiary hearing and the court would abuse its discretion by denying her such a hearing. And then it cites the case, which is Reyes v. State. Now, in this next part, we're going to go into the procedural background. <clears throat> Before we get to that, though, I will say that um, there are going to be two different um, issues that they're going to be raising, right? So um, just keep your eyes out for that um, as we get further into this motion. It's a very long motion. It's 254 pages. We're not going to go over nearly all 254 pages. Anyway, um, the procedural background, Armstrong was found guilty of murder on November 16th, 2023. She elected for the jury to assess punishment, and on November 17th, 2023, it assessed punishment at confinement in the Texas Department of Justice Institutional Division for a term of 90 years with a $10,000 fine. The court imposed sentence in accordance with the jury's verdict the same day. Armstrong timely files this motion within the required 30-day period, and then it Basis for the motion, um, one, there is newly available evidence that was not available at the time of the trial regarding the state's proffered ALP expert, Dr. Tim Califut, the presence of which would probably bring about a different result in a new trial. And then Texas Code of Criminal Procedure 40.001 provides that a new trial shall be granted an accused where material evidence favorable to the accused has been discovered since trial. Here, the newly discovered evidence is one, the November 17th, 2023 at 8.15 a.m. email from expert Tiffany Roy regarding an anticipated Texas Forensic Science Commission complaint regarding Califut's rebuttal testimony and the state forwarded to the defense after evidence had closed. The FSC complaint about his testimony and or three, the discovery of the falseness of his testimony as brought to light by one and two. See um, yeah, exhibit 2-3 and 10 to 11. The exculpatory information contained within the email reads as follows. Tim, I hope this finds you well. I received this email from Matt, Matt Quartaro this morning and we just had a brief call. I knew this email was coming. I just didn't know when I would receive it or who would bring it to my attention. This was and always has been what I believed you would begin doing. While I, I acknowledge this post on Twitter likely misstates your actual testimony and you surely commented on the evidence given the proposition, this guerrilla style analysis is wholly inappropriate and I personally am not going to tolerate it. You authored no report in this case. You were not listed as a witness. You were called in rebuttal after the expert assisting <clears throat> the defense had already been released and was in the car on his way back to Dallas. I don't even know if that's legal. It shouldn't be. 
You testified for the prosecutor and you were likely paid to provide this opinion. I doubt sincerely if this opinion was reviewed by another person qualified to perform evaluations like this. This is the very reason why I opposed your OSAC document. This, or is that OSAC? I don't know. This is the very reason why I oppose national. No, maybe it's notion, notional assignment of probabilities. What you did in this case is not in line with best practice, and you know it. You should have authored a written report. You should have provided the basis for your opinion. You should have given Matt Quattara the opportunity to review it and challenge it before this case ever went to trial. I've been told that the training that was provided at Sam Houston with Sue Pope and Jonathan Whitaker was completely in line with, with ENFSI and ISFG guidance. But in practice, you violate that guidance by doing this. I don't know how the colleagues you drafted that document with would feel knowing you are doing this, but they should be aware that you actively disregard the guidance they helped create. You delegitimize the framework so many have worked to build. Strongly based on balance and transparency, the, when you do this. I don't even know what the evidence was in this case, and I don't think it matters. I don't care if there was a mountain of evidence that would have resulted in a conviction without this impropriety. It will matter in some case. It will be the difference between a conviction and an acquittal. It will, without a doubt, risk miscarriage of justice. Texas is a death penalty state, and what you say on the witness stand can actually be the difference between life and death. I want you to know I've requested this transcript. I want you to know I'm going to pursue every avenue I have to stop you from doing this going forward. Complaints are coming. I want you to know this isn't science. This isn't transparency. I want everyone who supported your document to see how what precious little training you have on evaluations of findings given proposed activities is being exercised. This is unethical. I want everyone who has supported your advocacy of this practice to see how it's being applied and how it impacts real cases and real human beings. You have complete agency on how you conduct yourself, but you're, you delegitimize forensic DNA as a practice when you do what you did in this case. Most sincerely, Tiffany Roy. Roy is identified at the bottom of the email chain as a forensic DNA expert with forensic aid. Califa represented to Roy that he prepared a report in this case. See Exhibit 7. Undersigned counsel's inquiries to both parties on that point refute that rep representation. E.g. State denies one was prepared. Defense never received if one was prepared. See Exhibit 8. Roy has provided an affidavit attached as Exhibit 10. To the extent there was a report prepared and not produced to the defense, this would be an obvious Texas Code of Criminal Procedure 3914A violation. Testifying defense expert Matt Quattaro provided an affidavit attached as Exhibit 11 that explains what he would have done differently had the defense known this testimony was going to be offered. He also alerts the court to the believed novelty of this testimony that the court did not appear to have the benefit of at the time the testimony was offered and admitted. The newly discovered evidence test requires a defendant show one, the newly discovered evidence was unknown or unavailable to the defendant at the time of the trial. Two, the defendant's failure to discover or obtain the new evidence was not due to the defendant's lack of due, del due diligence. Three, the new evidence is admissible and not merely cumulative, corrobor corroborative, collateral, or impeaching. And four, the new evidence is probably true and will probably bring about a different result in a new trial. Carson v. State. And let's go back up here to these little footnotes. Okay, three. If there is a report that went undisclosed, defendant would add that to her list of newly discovered evidence, but at the time of filing, that is unknown. That Open question supports the need for an evidentiary hearing. And then footnote four, there does not appear to be a subpoena application for Califoot in the clerk's record. The state's expert, the state's expert disclosures appearing to be seven total, 927, 929, 10, 3, 10, 15, 10, 16, 10, 20, and 
10.24, likewise, do not list him. Here, it should be undisputed that the evidence was previously unknown to the defense prior to the November 16th email. The defense had no notice or knowledge Caliphate was going to testify, and therefore there is no lack of diligence as to discovery of it that the defense failed to exercise. The new evidence is admissible. Because this was a circumstantial case, the state clearly felt it had a gap in its proof that warranted the use of this testimony. The new information would probably bring about a different result in a new trial. Further, because this was rebuttal testimony and the last evidence or some of the last evidence the jury heard, its probable impact cannot be ignored. In the alternative, to preserve error, Armstrong asserts counsel was ineffective for failing to, one, move for the con move for a continuance to have time to investigate possible challenges to Caliphate's testimony and or to object to lack of notice since none of the state's seven witness list expert disclosures appear to list Caliphate and or three object under Texas rules of evidence 702 not qualified and 705 insufficient scientific basis to Caliphate's testimony. Ex parte ard um, and that holds the attorney was ineffective for inadequately presenting expert testimony and Sessoms v. State ineffective for failure to object to bad expert testimony. Uh, footnote five, even if newly discovered evidence impeaches a witness, the evidence may still warrant a new trial if it is material and competent independent of its impeaching tendencies. Uh, and then Footnote six just lists the subpoena dates again. And then footnote seven under 3914B, notice is required upon request for experts who may testify at trial. So it should have been disclosed. Um, okay, back to the motion. So Roman numeral two, the use of false testimony by state expert Tim Califoot violated Armstrong's state and federal due process rights pursuant to Texas rule of appellate procedure 21.1A and 21.3B8 and H9 and the 5th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 19 of the Texas Constitution. Defendant asserts she is entitled to a new trial because the state sponsored the materially false rebuttal testimony of Dr. Califut. And then now we're going to go into the re relevant law. Okay, I do also just want to say that there was an upload error when this motion was uploaded into the system with the court clerk. It wasn't the attorney's error. It was the actual um, person at the clerk's office that was scanning the documents through. And so some of the actual pages to this are missing. Um, so we're not going to be able to go over the, the whole motion since we don't have it. Um, but we will try to go over what we can. Um, when we're talking about the relevant case law, the first issue that um, they start discussing is convictions secured by false testimony, uh, which violates a defendant's due process rights under the 5th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution. They say due process is violated whether the state has knowingly or unknowingly presented such false testimony, whether or not the falsity of the testimony is known to the state at the time of trial is similarly immaterial. There is no need to show that the witness committed perjury, improper suggestions, insinuations, and assertions of personal knowledge can constitute false testimony. In order to be entitled to relief, a defendant must show that one, the false testimony was presented at his trial, and two, the testimony was material, meaning there is a reasonable likelihood that it affected the judgment of the jury. Whether te testimony is false is determined by asking whether the testimony, when taken as a whole, gives the jury a false impression. Then we're going to go to the relevant facts. Halifax's testimony was false in three primary respects. One, he was not qualified on act activity level propositions, ALP, and falsely gave the jury the impression he was. Two, the ALP technique is a technique in its scientific infancy at best and at this time should be deemed a junk science based on its rate of error 
for proficient practitioners. And three, even if the court disagrees with one and or two, Caliphate falsely overstated his degree of confidence and consequently gave the jury a false or misleading impression. Next, uh, we're going to go into the Caliphate is not a qualified ALP expert. He represented himself to be qualified expert pursuant to the Texas Rule of Evidence 702 in the technique of ALP, which was false. He is not a qualified expert in such a text technique. The authorities on the authorities on expertise in this technique are doctors Duncan Taylor and uh, Boss Cookshorn, who co-authored a nearly 600-page authoritative text on this technique in 2023 titled Forensic DNA Trace Evidence Interpretation Activity Level Propositions and Likelihood Ratios. Doctors Taylor and Cockshorn recommended that any expert attempting to offer ALP testimony first have interpreted and reported on source level on at least 25 single source and or complex and or mixed NDA that's supposed to be DNA, profiles divided over a minimum of five case requests in the past five years that have been subjected to collegial review or supervision and as well as have interpreted and reported on at least five cases containing propositions on activity level in the past five. And then we're missing page nine. So page 10 doesn't really make sense, but they're just attacking his qualification as an expert. Um, they say that his formal education does not qualify him as a DNA expert, and he misled the jury by claiming his 20-year career as a DNA analyst and then we're missing page 11, so can't do much else with that either. But again, we're, we are um, referencing those same two authorities, the 600-page text authors. So let me just say, if you go back to my videos in the playlist on the day that they did the DNA evidence, you will remember that we were talking about trace versus transfer DNA. So if the DNA that is found on an item is there because, like say this mouse, right? Somebody finds DNA on it later, it's my DNA. And is it there because I touched it? Or is my DNA there because my daughter touched it with a glove I had been wearing, which got my DNA on it. That's transfer. I don't even know if that's a really good example, but that's kind of what it was. What they were talking about was whether or not the DNA on the bicycle of um, Mo Wilson, remember there was some of Caitlin's DNA on the bicycle and on the helmet, I think. Oh, wait, no, it wasn't the helmet. They were saying that the defense was saying that it could, or they were trying to show that maybe it could have the, by the DNA of Caitlin's on the bicycle could have come from Mo or maybe Colin because Caitlin's DNA possibly could have been on the motorcycle helmet that Mo had been wearing, right? So that would have been transfer DNA. And in rebuttal, the state called this caliphate guy to come in and say, oh, no, 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 that's not, that's not likely. He was given two um, propositions by the state to go off of, one being trace, one being transfer. And he said that it was, what was it? Um, he, by claiming that it is more likely or much more likely if the defendant's DNA ended up on the bicycle from the state's theory rather than the defense's. So that's what, that's what we're fighting over here, right? And someone has now come in and said that this guy is not following the rules. Okay, and then on this same point, lastly, this paragraph says, defendant would again draw the analogy between the issues of improper degrees of confidence 
other forensic disciplines, including DNA interpretation, have reckoned with including microscopic hair comparisons, bite mark evidence, tool mark, and ballistic comparisons. And they say testimony, testimony using term reasonable scientific certainty and noting that terms like reasonable scientific certainty, a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, or a reasonable degree of discipline certainty have no scientific meaning and may mislead jurors or judges when deciding whether guilt has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And that comes from the National Commission on Forensic Sciences, I think. Now, here is the good one. Roman numeral three, Armstrong received ineffective assistance of counsel at punishment by counsel's failure to one, conduct a proper mitigation investigation and or two, contact favorable witnesses who were available and willing to testify in support of Armstrong and such failure clearly prejudiced her as evidenced by the near maximum 90 year sentence and $10,000 fine. Um, Texas rule of appellate procedure 21.1a and 21.9 permits the trial judge to grant a new trial as to punishment only. The rule allows a trial court to grant a new trial on punishment only if the basis for granting a motion relates to a ground that affected only the assessment of punishment. This claim is asserted on the basis, is asserted on that basis. Um, as to punishment, the defense was ineffective for one, failure to conduct a proper mitigation or sentencing investigation, and or two, failure to contact available, favorable, or potentially favorable witnesses. And that, then they cite the case law. Um, for instance, one where ineffective for failure to contact 20 potentially favorable character witnesses for punishment. And... One that says to show prejudice, defendant must present affidavits from available individuals who would have testified on defendant's behalf and the substance of their testimony. A defendant is required to show that mitigating evidence was available before he can establish ineffective assistance based on a failure to present mitigating evidence. Guillory v. State, that is no problem here. See exhibits 12 through 18. A review of the mitigation evidence left uncovered in this case and discovered by appellate counsel in less than 30 days is tragically equivalent to a total absence of advocacy skills at defendant's sentencing. If defense counsel's deficient performance might have affected a punishment verdict, the relevant issue when considering the prejudice element of an ineffective assistance claim is whether there is a reasonable probability that absent the errors the sentencer would have assessed a more lenient punishment. Considering the sentence here was 90 years and a maximum fine, there should be no question that this mitigating evidence would have resulted in a more lenient punishment. The defense had collected a dozen character letters for a possible bond reduction hearing that contained the contact information of important potential favorable punishment witnesses. The individuals who gave these letters were as follows. Sharon Armstrong, mother. Nick Gapin, childhood best friend, Roberta Hamilton, longtime family friend, Sarah Hilbers, cousin, Cheryl Lynn, yoga friend, Deb Prost, longtime family friend, Elizabeth Smith, longtime family friend, Joe Smith, former coach, Maureen, I can't even say that last name, family friend through church, Jim and or Mary Reichel, Rachel, uncle and aunt, Beth Weeks, longtime family friend, Christopher Weeks' friend. Of the individuals on this list, appellate counsel has been able to reach meaning, meaningfully interview and secure affidavits from Sharon Armstrong, Nick Gapin, Roberta Hamilton, Deb Prost, and Beth Weeks. None reported being contacted by the defense regarding possibly testifying at sentencing, though all were willing and could have been available. Undersigned counsel asked trial counsel via email about the defense's mitigation investigation and how the defense ended up with three witnesses that ended up testifying and what may or may not have happened with others who were willing but not called. Counsel explained as follows. While one ex-boyfriend was contacted but did not want to be involved, we did not identify any other people familiar with Caitlin willing to testify for her. Further, counsel characterized her father and siblings' punishment testimony as speaking to Caitlin's background seemingly as to the strategic justification 
counsel lastly explained that the state's punishment argument was exclusively arguing evidence from guilt innocence. The issue at punishment was not Caitlin Armstrong's character. There was no dispute as to Caitlin's character, only the offense itself. We had acquired a number of character letters which were in the file early on in the case when we were considering a bond reduction strategy. Eventually, we went a different direction as evidence developed. Counsel also disclosed that, def that the defense team's mitigation specialist left the firm in July 2023. Undersigned counsel respectfully asserts that the contention that the defense did not identify any other people familiar with Caitlin willing to testify for her is in direct conflict to the dozen character letters the defense had in its file for a possible pretrial hearing. Had the defense contacted the individuals who provided the character letters, they would have discovered they were willing and available and the information these witnesses had would have led to other favorable witnesses who could have been contacted. Further, by contacting these witnesses, counsel would have also discovered the compelling and powerful evidence about Caitlin's childhood and trauma history that was not brought before the jury that would have mitigated the sentence in this case. Specifically, as exhibits 12 through 18 reveal, appellate counsel has learned as follows. At about four years old, Caitlin's parents began going through a divorce after mom found out that dad had been having a year-long affair with a younger woman and she was pregnant. Mom was likewise pregnant with Caitlin's youngest sibling when she found out. The divorce was finalized by the time Caitlin was five and her youngest sibling was an infant. The divorce left mom as the primary parent for three children under eight. Dad soon married the woman with whom he had an affair and they would go on to have three children together. While the relationship, uh, what relationship Caitlin and her siblings had with their step mother was at best complicated. Dad was present and consistently in Caitlin's life from the time she was five through her high school years. Dad was on court-ordered child and alimony support and struggled to financially provide for two families. Mom and dad's recollections still differ to this day about what was ultimately paid and whether dad made consistent payments. At some point, mom believes she cooperated in legal efforts to forgive some arrears so that he would not go to jail and leave his other new family without him. During high school, when Caitlin was told about the expected arrival of dad and his second wife's third child, she told him that because he cannot afford the children he does have, he should not have another one. She also promised that if he had another child, she would no longer speak to him. Because dad's second wife was already pregnant, dad reported his and Caitlin's relationship was broken after that. Up until her arrest, their contact was still minimal. Mom was devastated by dad's betrayal and reality of raising two young children and an infant alone. Mom drank as a coping mechanism, a struggle that runs in her family. Mom's drinking was described as that of a still struggling alcoholic and her drinking demon was referred to as like a cancer of the family. Caitlin's childhood best friend described going over to Caitlin's house almost daily for years and observing mom was usually very drunk. Her sister recalled the constant feeling of helplessness she, her brother, and Caitlin had because their primary caregiver was an alcoholic. As her family struggled during her childhood, her best childhood friend also recalled Caitlin was the victim of multiple instances of actual or attempted sexual violence. Her sister has observed Caitlin's ability to disassociate because of trauma of her childhood. Caitlin has also been pregnant twice, one occasion of which was during or near the time of her arrest. Considering the sentence here was 90 years and a maximum fine, there should be no question that this mitigating evidence would have resulted in a more lenient punishment. Okay. Hold on a second. Let's see here. Okay. So because this document is so incredibly long and because that part of the discussion was pretty boring, um, the for the rest, I'm going to do this in two different parts because we're already at 30 minutes here. But as you can see, uh, they brought up a lot of good issues. I think the one as to mitigation is probably the stronger argument of the two. Um, and in the next in part two of this video, we will look at the affidavits that the um, appellate counsel collected from the those witnesses that they would have that they say should have been called during mitigation, and we'll see like what her sister actually had to say about their childhood growing up. I did find it super interesting during the actual trial that nothing was brought up about. Well, there was just like no mitigation. 
there was no mitigation put on um, during sentencing, during the sentencing portion of the trial. Um, there was a, somebody who did like some kind of Bible study or something like that at the church. I mean, not at the church, at the jail that came in and talked about how Caitlin had taught somebody how to meditate in their jail cell. And her dad talked about how she was such a great little kid. And her sister talked about how she didn't think it was fair that this was happening and that Caitlin was wonderful and had always been wonderful and always cared about people. And she loved her so much. And that was it. And it was not helpful. Um, but after reading the affidavit and once we go through it, I think you'll see that there actually was a lot more that could have been put on to show um, some mitigation to potentially get her a lesser sentence here. And it is possible for her to be granted a new uh, punishment trial, like for them to just redo the sentencing part, right? Um, so that is what we will be looking at in the next one. So stay tuned and don't forget to like and subscribe, turn on your notifications and as always come back and check out Weekly Live for new content. Thanks guys. Bye.